Lasers, Cavers, and Magic, a true story of the one man's journey from guns and lasers to metaphysics and spirituality by Stephen D. Kelly. To my dear Danelle and my children, thank you for your patience. Introduction. The story represents a personal journey of evolution, 30 years in the making. My intention is to only show the series of events and experiences that have helped me to realize the path that I would learn to follow. There are no coincidences that arbitrarily happen to us. Every person we meet and everything that takes place in our lives is intended to move us along to our ultimate destination. By recounting my steps, I hope to show the reader the influences that allowed me to connect the dots and become the person I am today. At times the information may seem heavy and possibly difficult to accept. In order to deal with the many revelations, I have been obligated to develop a very open mind and to learn how to store away every bit of information, no matter how incredible. This skill has served me well over the years, as I would find that what I may conceive as impossible one day will resurface many years later to be reconsidered under new circumstances. This ability to maintain an open mind and to file away vast amounts of disparate information is a very important part of what I would like the reader to develop. I ultimately hope that you will come away from this with a positive message. The major lesson is that we can choose to become mostly service to others as opposed to being mostly service to self. This is the path of all the greatest spiritual teachers that have lived on the earth. This is also the most effective way to increase our own human potential. We humans have great power that is waiting to be awakened. This is the magic. The world we live in today is a product of our mass perceived reality. A time will come soon when people will be able to create their own reality. This is the ultimate gift bestowed on humans by our creator. We start by increasing our psychic skills. We grow more powerful when we share this energy with people around us. This is why it is so important to realize we are all related and that we need to learn to love every other human. Once we have learned to avoid being drawn into the negative effects of being polarized by issues that the media bombards us with, we can learn to practice unconditional love. When we watch the news, we are force-fed stories that play on our emotions and compel us to hate those that are portrayed as evildoers. We take sides and allow ourselves to become polarized, which divides us and limits our ability to understand and have compassion. I know this is difficult to do. I personally went through a great shock to my core beliefs before I could come to terms with this concept. If you visualize the yin and yang symbol, imagine that it is always spinning. The amount of black and white is ever-changing. There is always a small amount of white or black at any spot on the circle. This is a perfect representation of the world we live in. Nothing is ever black or white. It is always shades of gray. Likewise, this applies to good and evil. When it comes to humans, there is always a small amount of both present. This is the first thing we learn on the road to becoming observers. There is a list of suggested reading for further research. I hope that everyone will want to learn more about the people I have listed. Several of them have made great contributions and have paid a steep price for their leadership. There is also a glossary that I hope will help with some of the technical terms I have used. Telling this story is very important to me, and I hope the reader can appreciate the commitment and personal sacrifice I make to bring this information to you. My motivation is to help others to grow and become more powerful individuals and leaders. I am very passionate about this message, and I look forward to the result of my being able to share it with you. A Day in the Life of Stephen Kelly There was a time when I was like everyone else. I was happy and innocent and looked forward to living my life and growing old with my family close by. All of that changed for me in one day in the early 1990s. Like many Americans, I was raised to be patriotic and believed my country was righteous and could do no wrong. Now, I was in an office in front of a desk with a man that I thought was CIA sitting across from me. He was smiling and telling me a story about a village deep in the jungle of Honduras. There were people living there men, women, and children, and all of their animals. 
Supposedly, these people were sympathetic to forces that wanted to change the government. One day, a group of soldiers came to that village deep in the jungle. They surrounded the area and systematically killed everyone and everything living in that village. They killed every man, woman, and child there was. They killed the animals, every goat, pig, chicken, and dog. And when they were done, a big helicopter flew in with a bulldozer hanging underneath it. Somebody got on that bulldozer and dug a big trench. He then scraped the entire village into that hole. Every hut, every person, every dead animal went into the pit. The trench was covered with earth, and the helicopter flew away, taking the bulldozer with it. The men with the guns disappeared back into the jungle and left behind nothing but a clearing where the village once stood. This was a CIA death squad, and these men did this in the name of my country. I was in shock, and everything I was raised to believe about right and wrong was shattered. My innocence was taken away from me that day, and I could never go back to being the person I was before. Every child is born a genius. Richard Buckminster Fuller, Early Years I was born in Long Beach, California, on May 28, 1958. I came out three minutes after my identical twin, Norman. We were premature and spent some time in an incubator before going home to my parents, Dorothy and Henry, in Los Altos, California. My younger sister, Erin, was born a little over a year later. My parents both came from broken families, where the mother had left the father and relocated from the East Coast to a small town in Oregon, the kind of place where everyone knows everyone else and you can't get away with anything. My dad was a handsome young guy who had come back from the war in Korea. He worked as a lumberjack and as a fireman. Like all the men in my family back then, he drove a motorcycle. My mom had red hair and was your typical small-town beauty that dreamed of moving to the big city and having the best of everything. I never met either of my grandfathers and did not get to meet much of the family that was left behind. I think in later years, I resented how an unhappy woman could relocate her family and cause them to lose the connection to their roots and diminish their standard of living. When my brother and I were two years old, the family moved to a new home on Cherry Street in Los Alamitos, not far from Long Beach. Kathy Rigby, the Olympic gymnast, grew up down the street from us, and I used to play with her younger brother, Jeff. I remember as kids, we used to watch her practice on a balance beam in her parents' front yard. I had no idea what a balance beam was, but she could do amazing tricks on it. Little did I know that that little girl with the short blonde hair would go on to become an Olympic champion. She would even babysit us a few times. And then, there she was, on TV in front of the world. The next time I saw her was after the Olympics and we were trick-or-treating on Halloween. She answered the door at her parents' house and she was wearing a luxurious black fur coat. She had become a bona fide celebrity and we were very proud that she was from our neighborhood. My earliest memories were when I was five playing in a local park on a huge swing set. My mom would take us kids there because it had the best playground in the area. I know I was five because I remember playing with a little girl there and announcing to her, I'm five. I also remember that we had a little black dog named Pepper and that my dad planted a maple tree in the front yard. Years later, I would go back and visit that house and that tree was enormous. I also remember when I became self-aware. That is a very important time in anybody's life. It's when you realize that you are inside your head looking out on the world and that everyone around you is a separate person, and not just there for you to see and interact with. I was in my room, which I shared with my brother, and I was sitting on the top of our bunk bed. Those thoughts and feelings never really go away. Some people call that the center of the universe syndrome. Today, I still have to consider everything I experience and why I am here. Even at that early age, I had visions of a great desert war which seemed strange to me at the time. I had never read the Bible, but I knew that this was Armageddon and I was going to play a role. Was I having a glimpse of my future? Was this a clue that our lives are programmed in advance and we plan everything to the last detail before we are even born? Is there really such a thing as free will? And do we have the power to control our destiny? My mother had decided to become a Catholic when she was young for reasons I never knew. 
Her family was Protestant and still attends a Lutheran church. My father was not very religious, as I recall, and went along with my mother but never really became Catholic himself. My brother and sister were enrolled in St. Hedwig's Catholic School, where we also went to church. My brother and I would even become altar boys. This was a good way to get out of class once in a while and was a little fun also. Back in those days, the nuns who were all Irish would administer discipline with a ruler on the knuckles. I was a pretty good kid, but even an altar boy gets in trouble sometimes. In sixth grade, I was elected class president, which just meant that I was responsible when the teacher was out of the room. My brother and I were very artistic at a very young age and loved to find a good clean piece of paper to draw on. I remember when we were very little, we would tape sheets of paper together to make large elaborate drawings of underground cities with extensive tunnels, elevators, and submarine pens. Where the heck did that come from? Did I live in such a place in a past life? Much of what I write will include stories about my brother because we are two sides of the same coin. The significance of that will become more important in later years. The family moved to a larger house in suburbia estates, not far from where we were living before. And we continued at parochial school until the sixth grade, when we were enrolled in a public junior high school. Leaving our friends back at St. Hedwig's was hard, but we made new friends and became quite popular. Junior high was a rich time in my life. I had several girlfriends, some at the same time. I went to all the school dances that were always in the school cafeteria. My sister, who was a year younger, went with us and would always have her friends with her. There was no shortage of cute girls to dance with. She had one friend that I had a crush on named Sherry. She had dark, curly hair and was well endowed at an early age. I was madly in love with her, but she felt that I was like a brother to her and let me know she felt that way. Many years later, I would see her again and she was finally interested in me. But by then, I was married and it wasn't to be. My brother and I learned to scuba dive when we were 14 and went on diving trips with my dad and our friends. I had one friend from Catholic school whose father was the president of Scuba Pro, which makes the finest scuba diving equipment in the world. We would visit and see diving gear all over his garage. When we were being trained, the instructor found out about our connection and treated my brother and me extra special. We dove in Malibu, Laguna Beach, Catalina Island, and Mexico. Mexico has some of the best diving in the world. The colors and rich amounts of vegetation and sea life is a stark contrast to the land above the waves. We even used to bring our tanks to Newport Harbor and try to make some extra money cleaning the bottoms of people's boats. Scuba diving is an incredibly visual experience and it provided me with great subjects to write about in the creative writing class. I feel very lucky to have had that experience, but the deep dark ocean still scares the hell out of me. My brother and I both joined the Boy Scouts and did a lot of hiking. A couple of our friends were scouts, and it looked like a fun thing to do. We were both 14 at the time, and were a little old to be starting in scouts, but our age allowed us to be involved in the more elite activities normally reserved for the Eagle Scouts. Several of my friends were well off, and we spent much time on the ocean sailing or enjoying their family's yachts. Being scuba divers, this was great because it's a heck of a lot easier to dive out of the back of a boat than to swim out from the beach. One of our friend's dad was a plastic surgeon and was a member of the Alamitos Bay Yacht Club. We would jump in a little sailboat at the yacht club and sail over to Seaport Village on the other side of the channel. After buying some goodies, we would sail back to the center of the bay and relax with our lunch. We rode our bikes everywhere and would go to the beach often. Sometimes, one of us would have to sit on the handlebars and hang on for dear life while we zipped through intersections. Living in Orange County had one major perk. We had Disneyland in our backyard. I used to feel sorry for all the kids that had to grow up in other states with no Disneyland nearby. We used to plan our trips out like military operations. We were always looking for ways to run amok. We would bring grabbers and try to get jewels from inside the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. We would sneak around the fence on Tom Sawyer's Island and run around the area that was not open to the public. We even stole the arrow from the chest of the dead settler in front of the burning cabin. One summer, I got in trouble at Disneyland and my mother put me on restriction. My brother was with me, but I took the rap. I was not allowed to go anywhere or see my friends. I spent most of that summer doing yard work in the backyard. 
I must have been doing a good job because she decided I needed something else to distract me, so she gave me a book to read. It was Ian Fleming's James Bond, Dr. No, of all the James Bond books she could have given me. This was the one that contained a small amount of sex. I don't think that was her intention to expose my young mind to that, but it was just enough to get my attention and cause me to consume every James Bond book in the series. That was the beginning of what would become a voracious appetite for reading. I became addicted and went through more books than I can remember. I spent many hours reading in bed or laying on the beach with a thick book like The Lord of the Rings. I enjoyed historical novels and would pick an author and read everything they wrote. I read all of the Conan books, every Edgar Rice Burroughs. My parents had a good collection in the family library, so I read most of their books, which were mostly written in the 60s. Eventually, I grew tired of fiction and moved on to biographies and historical or scientific subjects. My parents tried to instill a work ethic in us, so I had several jobs when I was young. Living in Los Alamitos, my brother and I were both paper boys. I had to get up early and ride my bike around tossing papers at people's doors. Getting up early and sitting on a street corner folding newspapers while freezing was not fun at all. We used to light little fires on the sidewalk to warm our hands. The streets were empty, and we could be delinquents. It's amazing how much trouble you can get away with when you have bags full of papers on your handlebars. The police didn't look at us twice. One of my clients was a house of prostitution. I did not know about such things at that age, but I always noticed when I was delivering the large amount of motorcycles parked on the lawn. There always seemed to be a constant flow of sailors in and out at all hours. One time my dad was driving me around as I was trying to collect receipts for the month. The whorehouse had a big German shepherd that always barked at me from behind the flimsy screen door. I never got too close to that house, but that day the dog decided to go through the screen door and attack me. My dad jumped out of the car and scared him off, but not before the German shepherd took a chunk out of me, leaving a nasty scar on my rear end. To this day, I can't understand why my parents didn't sue the property owner. We moved again, right before I was to graduate from junior high school. This time, we went to Anaheim, where my dad was going to work at his company's new office. The new house was big and very nice, and in those days, there were still orange groves and strawberry fields all over. We kids were not happy to be leaving our friends, and starting up at a new school was difficult and traumatic. There wasn't much we could do about it and we did our best to enjoy the new house. We each had our own rooms, with big closets. We had a swimming pool installed, and the backyard was planted with lush vegetation. More than likely, my dad was buying this big to keep my mom happy and give her a show place to impress her friends. When we moved, I had three girlfriends at the same time, and they all found out about the others after I left. Whether or not my leaving would have prevented my getting caught, I don't know. In hindsight, I wish she could have just commuted and left us where we were. The best memory I had from that new junior high was a girl I met in Spanish class named Teresa. She was also new to the school and had just moved to Anaheim from Utah. She was a blonde-haired beauty, and I swear she was the prettiest girl in the school. When my mother met her, she said that she had a face that could launch a thousand ships. She was comparing her to the legendary beauty Helen of Troy. We went out together all summer, and I introduced her to my friends. Just getting ready for high school is not a good time to be starting over, and the friends you make are not always the best quality. I started smoking pretty heavy, as I was hanging out with the kids that smoked. Unfortunately, she was a very good girl, and at that age my hormones were out of control, and I needed a girl that was not so pure. I let her go from my life, and always regretted it afterwards. When I was in high school, all the guys would fall over themselves when she walked by. When I told them that we used to go out together, they said that I was a liar, that I could never get a girl like that. It took many years for me to get over her. The only time I would ever see her again was at my high school reunion when I was standing there with my wife and she walked up behind me with her husband. We didn't talk, but both our spouses knew, and I remember the look in her husband's eyes. I think he knew. I still had a place for her in my heart. Throughout high school, my diet was awful and I didn't eat right. My mother was a good cook, 
but for some reason, we were sent to school without a decent breakfast and insufficient funds for a healthy lunch. For breakfast, I would usually have a cup of tea and toast, maybe a bowl of cereal. For lunch, I was lucky if I had a dollar to buy a crummy little frozen pizza from the lunch line. I was not an athlete, and I spent a lot of time hanging out with the smokers wherever they would congregate at school. I used to walk across campus with a lit cigarette in my hand without getting caught. Homework was a low priority and almost never got done, yet somehow I managed to get halfway decent grades. One thing I did do was to read the newspaper every morning, and I was very aware of what was going on in the world and able to astound my teachers with my knowledge of current events. When we moved to Anaheim, I got a job washing dishes at a local greasy spoon called Gilmore's. My brother and I both worked there, and we had some friends that worked there also. They had a Foster's Freeze on the side of the restaurant, and we used to make huge ice cream sundaes when the owner was gone for the night. When I was in high school, I got a job at Lucky's Supermarket bagging groceries. This is where I met my future wife, Danelle. The market job helped me afford to buy gas for my first car. It used to take $10 to fill it up, and I remember thinking how much money that was. My parents had an old blue 64 Ford Galaxy station wagon that I was allowed to take over when they wanted to get rid of it. It was a beast, but I poured money into it. I ripped out the back seats and covered everything in padding and thick shag carpeting. It had black tuck and roll on the ceiling, black paint on the rear windows, and an 8-track stereo with six 6x9 speakers. Of course, it also had big tires, magnesium wheels, and all the performance bolt-ons on the 352CU Big Block V8. I had custom-made white aluminized fender wall headers that I used to uncork so I could drive around town making horrendous noise. I especially liked to race past the high school when class was in session, making a roar that everyone could hear. It even had a racing transmission that would make that thing chirp the tires when it shifted. The back window was plastered with stickers for all the race car goodies I installed. The car was the last thing you wanted to see, park in front of your house when your daughter was going out on a date. It was a so-called sin bin. The police loved to pull me over and look for violations. I did not have any girlfriends all through high school. Because I was a smoker, the only girls I was exposed to were also smokers, and they did not interest me. When I met Danelle, it was almost graduation time for me. She was new to the high school and was coming out of an all-girls Catholic school. She got a job at the supermarket I was working at, and I was lucky enough to be the one to train her. The first night, I decided that I was going to make her mine. She was tall, just a little shorter than my six feet. She was Hispanic with long, dark hair and big brown eyes. She had a look that could pass for American Indian or maybe Italian. She used a shampoo that always made her hair smell great. She gave me a small lock of her hair, and I would sit there in class and hold it under my nose, keeping her scent with me. Her dad was an officer for Anaheim Police and very protective. He was a big Mexican guy that they called Dirty Dan. No doubt, that nickname didn't come from him being a nice guy. I am sure that when he saw my station wagon, he knew that he had to keep her away from me. He blocked her from going out with me for a long time. She was at an age where she was trying to break away from daddy's grip, and I was a bad boy that she found exciting. Before school, all my friends would sit in our cars out in the student parking lot and smoke. Danelle would watch us from afar and wonder what it was like to be part of our group. Psychology being what it is, the more her dad tried to keep me away from her, the more I wanted her. Persistence pays off, and eventually I was able to go out with her. Often, I would come to her house to pick her up, and her dad would be out front, talking to a nice young policeman that he wanted her to meet. That didn't work out very well. She wasn't interested in dating a cop. Several times, I would be leaving my parents' house, and there would be a police car sitting down the street, waiting for me. I would get pulled over, and the car would be inspected for violations. The things we put up with for love. After some time, I was somewhat begrudgingly accepted by her family. Her grandmother, who lived with her family, was nice to me. 
and I got exposed to lots of new foods, such as chorizo and eggs, which I now eat almost daily. One night, I was sitting in her parents' living room, and she told me that both she and her younger brother were both adopted. This was a shock to me, and I was not sure what to think. Later, after many years of marriage, I would come to understand the dynamics of having a spouse with adoptive parents. Danelle and I dated for four years. It was eight months before I ever touched her. The first time was one night when I was dropping her off in front of her parents' home. She was just as anxious as I was because we both went straight for the goods. Oh my, that was something. She had very white skin with freckles. And after we would get hot and heavy, her skin would get flushed and red on her chest. That was something she could not hide and her parents must have noticed. After I graduated, I would come onto the campus and visit her as she was younger than me and still in high school. I had devoted my artistic abilities into making jewelry using lost wax casting. I was very good and the woman who taught the jewelry class would allow me to continue to use the equipment at the school. This was a great way for me to see more of Danelle, who was in the class. Many of my projects were destined for her. Most of the jewelry I made was sterling silver and sometimes gold. This was back when you could buy an ounce of gold for $35. I told my parents to take all their money and buy gold, but they didn't listen to me and thought the bank was the best place to earn a return. God, I wish they had listened to me. Science is a wonderful thing if one does not have to earn one's living at it. Albert Einstein The Electro-Optics Industry After high school, I went to the local community college and started a business major, accounting, sales, and some general education, while still taking jewelry-making classes. At the same time, I thought I wanted to open a jewelry store. I thought a business major would help me be able to run my own company. My old high school had an ROP training program that taught precision optical lens manufacturing. A friend of mine took the class and got a job right away. This sounded like something interesting, so I enrolled. In the class, I learned the fundamentals of shaping, grinding, and polishing precision optical elements. Many of my high school friends were becoming electro-optical technicians, and this would have a profound effect on my future. To graduate from the program, you needed to complete 80 hours, which I blasted through while absorbing everything I could read about the electro-optical industry. Looking in the paper, I found an optics company that was hiring and went down for an interview. The company was Newport Research Corp. in Fountain Valley. This company was a pioneer in building special tables for use in holography research. Normally, these tables were made of thick slabs of granite. Newport invented a substitute for granite that used a much lighter honeycomb construction. Lasers need to be set up on surfaces that were very stable and were isolated from all vibrations. They also built special legs for the tables that used pneumatics to make the table float and remove the slightest vibration. The company had set up an in-house optical fabrication unit to supply precision optics for use with their systems. When I got there, Many people were waiting in the personnel office for their turn to be interviewed. When it was my turn, I walked down to the way to meet the people running the optics facility. Being prepared, I had with me my certificate from the class and a display case with some of my handmade jewelry and some of the lenses I had polished. Turned out, the boss was an old friend of the guy teaching the class and he was happy to meet me. Before the interview was over, I remember him picking up the phone and telling the personnel office to send everybody that was waiting home. So now, I was part of the electro-optical industry. It was 1977, and lasers were just beginning to become practical, and the technology was changing the world. My job was to run an edging machine that would grind the edges of the lenses to a specific diameter. I also cleaned the optics and learned about many other operations in the optical manufacturing process. My parents' house was still my home. They let me build a room in the garage and I set up a tiny jewelry manufacturing area. When I was frustrated about something at work, I would invest in a piece of equipment. Before long, I had everything I needed to create jewelry and do repairs in my little shop. The room was only about 8 feet square, but I could sit there and access all my equipment and do great things. Things were beginning to get tense at home. 
my dad began to have health problems and started on a dialysis program. My mom was not there for him, and I resented the way she took care of her needs and left him alone constantly. Things at home began to deteriorate fast after that. My mother did not really want me around to witness her indiscretions. I was spending a lot of time with my Danelle. My favorite place to take her was the drive-in movie theater, where we could occupy the area in back of my station wagon. This was also the time I decided to stop smoking because it interfered with the kissing. I couldn't get enough of her. We were in the back of my station wagon almost every night. It didn't matter what the movie was or how many times we saw it. We weren't watching. My parents weren't thrilled that I was dating a Mexican girl, even though she was just as white as us. Even in the late 70s, there was still a good amount of bias. This made me want her even more. One day, when I was working at Newport, I found a small helium neon laser tube broken in the trash can. The tube was very small for the technology of the time. The company was designing a weapon-mounted laser aiming device. I thought the broken laser was cool, and I took it home with me. The next day, the senior engineer was freaking out because the laser he tossed in the trash can was supposedly a big secret. I was made to go home and return with the tube and promptly fired. The company went on to produce several laser aiming systems that found their way into police and military applications. The laser was made famous when Arnold Schwarzenegger used one in the first Terminator movie. You might remember the scene when he walks into the nightclub and shines the little red dot on Linda Hamilton's head. Eventually, one of the principals of the company named John Matthews decided to separate from Newport Corporation and would form a new company, Laser Products, which would focus on the weapon applications. Newport Corporation would soon become Newport Corp, and Laser Products would be renamed Surefire. After Newport, I went to work for a manufacturing jeweler who I met after I'd gone there to have some diamonds set into one of my high school jewelry projects. He was very impressed with my skills and was happy to give me a job. Here, I learned to do repairs, set diamonds, and did all the wax carving and lost wax casting. Those skills, combined with my electro-optical experience, would come in very handy in the future. I worked there for about a year and would take long lunches so I could rush home and spend some quality time with Danelle. One day, a woman came in wanting to sell a diamond ring. The owner of the store looked at it and said he wasn't interested. The girl working the counter brought the ring back to me and said, Take a look at this. Your girlfriend would love it. It was a wedding band with five 20-point diamonds, totaling one carat. She only wanted $75. Fortunately, I had the money to buy it and went back and cleaned up the ring. Turned out, the stones were very nice. After showing my boss the freshly cleaned ring, he said he should have bought it. Danelle had moved into an apartment with a friend of hers. She wasn't even 18 yet. And I was spending most of my time with her. When I came home from work and showed the ring to her, she exclaimed, Does this mean we're getting married? I was so naive. It did not occur to me. What would happen when she saw the ring? Of course, I gave it to her and we were engaged. It was not too long before I wanted to get back into precision optics. After being in retail sales, I felt my skills were being wasted. There were plenty of optical companies in the area, and I easily got hired at another company, J.L. Wood in Santa Ana, and began to rapidly expand my knowledge. J.L. Wood was a medium-sized company named after the owner, Jim Wood. They produced a high-quality product and were responsible for designing and building the special camera lenses that made the Star Wars movie possible. They put me to work in quality control, and I spent many hours using a laser interferometer to evaluate optical elements during production and final QC. I was now beginning to get paid pretty well and could afford to buy myself some toys, like my first handgun, a 357 caliber revolver. I also moved out of my parents' home and rented my own apartment. My mother was in a big hurry for both my brother and me to move out of the house. He was very bitter about that, as he was not as prepared as I was. On the other hand, I wanted a place where I could be alone with Danelle. When I talked to the manager lady at the apartment complex, I told her that I would move in with my wife as soon as I got married. She thought I was wonderful for being so old-fashioned. Danelle and I got married, 
March 1, 1980, at St. Anthony's Catholic Church in Anaheim. The reception held at the Phoenix Club in Anaheim was relatively big, with 300 people. My friend Bill, whom I knew from junior high back in Los Alamitos, was my best man. Bill and I both were big fans of James Bond books and iced tea. Drinking large amounts of iced tea daily is still a big vice for me. Bill was a major influence in my life, and I will return to him many times in this story. For our honeymoon, we spent five weeks driving up the California coast in a big white Cadillac that we borrowed from Danelle's aunt. We stopped in Morro Bay the first night. Then we went on to Monterey and spent a night in San Francisco. On our last night in California, we stopped at a little motel in Humboldt and slept on a waterbed that was like a big water balloon. Then it was on to Oregon, where we visited with my family. It rained a lot while we were there, but we got to do some fishing and spent a good amount of time in the little bowling alley in town. Danelle must have seemed exotic to my cousins because they would make suggestive comments when it was time for my wife and me to retreat to our honeymoon refuge. When we returned to California, Danelle and I immediately moved into a one-bedroom condo, which we bought when interest rates were at 18%. Ouch. At the time, I was not working because I got in trouble at J.L. Wood for telling someone how much I was getting paid. That was a big no-no, and the personnel department was not happy about it. I made some money doing labor with Danelle's uncle Ernie mixing cement and plastering houses. Ernie was a big Mexican guy with a thick mustache. He had a big old yellow truck that we rode all over the place to the jobs. He would make egg burritos that we would eat on the way to the job site early in the morning. This was a far cry from precision optics or even making jewelry, but I got some good exercise and some sunshine. We worked on mostly luxury homes and locations such as Laguna Beach. This was a different experience for me because often the homeowners would look at me like I was a simple laborer and you could feel the disrespect they had. This was not a major blow to my ego, but I thought that these people had no idea who I was and my background. This was my first major lesson in humility. Ernie and I got along very well, but this was temporary, and eventually I would get back into optics. Danelle and I were a very passionate couple, and I knew the neighbors were a little jealous. There seemed to be several single women in our complex that lived vicariously through us. Our friends didn't come close to the amount of sex we had. There was a swimming pool right outside the front door of our condo. We would get out of the pool and not even make it to the bedroom. Our extended honeymoon lasted for quite a while. We were under some pressure to have children from her parents and Danelle's grandmother. Our first child, Michelle, was born a few years later. When I married Danelle, I knew she would be a good mother and would produce big, healthy babies. She was blessed with what they call childbearing hips. She also had wonderful, bountiful breasts that her doctor once said could feed all the babies in the nursery. I was happy when she was pregnant and she would give me six wonderful children. I was there in the delivery room for each of them. And I can say that the feeling you get when the new child is finally there is the best you can experience. As a father, I can only describe how I felt, but for those who have not had children, I can say that this is what life is all about. Sometime in the early 80s, I was hired by the Perkin Elmer Corporation. Perkin Elmer was started by Mr. Perkin and Mr. Elmer right before World War II because these men knew that most precision optics came from Germany, and they knew that the United States needed to develop a domestic source for all the optics the war effort would require. This company became one of the largest and most important optical companies in the world. They were famous for building many of the large observatory telescopes all over the world. They even built the primary lens for the Hubble Space Telescope. The part of the company that made the large telescope optics was called the Massive Optics Department. This is where I worked. These were the Reagan years, and the optics industry was booming. Lasers and ultra-precision optics were driving the semiconductor industry, and I began to make components for microlithography systems that were used to make semiconductors. Microlithography is a photographic process where an extremely detailed mask is exposed to a light source that projects a pattern onto a substrate 
such as silicon, that has been treated with chemicals to etch the details into material deposited onto the surface of the substrate. This process is repeated several times with many layers of different materials being deposited. It was very rewarding to be able to push the edge of the tolerances and advance the technology further every day. I felt great satisfaction in knowing that my efforts directly affected millions of people and made our country stronger. Eventually, I was running a whole area of the massive optics department with many people under me and was responsible for all Plano or flat optics. This included all windows, laser mirrors, reflective optics, or anything with a precision flat surface. This was cutting-edge technology. The bulk of everything we did went into advanced weapon systems. It seemed like parts I was touching went into everything from tanks, jets, ships, helicopters, missiles, and anything you could imagine. At the time, I never thought that it would all be unleashed in the not-too-distant future. I didn't mind working on parts for Star Wars. What I did not want to do was make components for nuclear missiles. Who wants to work hard and do a good job on something that you hope will never be used? One of the nice things about Perk and Elmer was that they would pay for expenses for employees that wanted to go to school. Lens making involves all kinds of math and geometry. In school, the teachers never do a good job of showing why it is necessary to learn mathematics. Working with all those prisms and complex shapes illustrated very well the importance of what you could do with math. I decided to go back to school and start at the very beginning with algebra. Only taking one course at a time allowed me to focus and get an A in each subject. I went all the way up to second semester calculus. One thing I found to be disconcerting was the fact that by the time I reached that level, that I was the last white person in the class. By then, all my classmates were Asian, Iranian, or of Indian descent. This gave me a bad impression about my fellow Caucasian students, who seemed to only want to take the easy courses. Another great thing about working at Perkin Elmer was that there were engineers all over the company who were always happy to help me understand a difficult equation. The work was such that I could also do my homework on the job. Perkin Elmer was a world leader in the manufacture of computer chip manufacturing hardware. At this time, they were making a new system for producing 6-inch diameter wafers. A finished wafer is cut up into tiny squares to yield hundreds of computer chips. This machine was built around a key component called a gas bar, which was a large aluminum block, precision polished on four sides, and served as an air bearing that complex optical elements slid on during the scanning process of the wafer exposure. Meanwhile, the company was only able to produce two units a week of this component, and it was causing major issues with assembly line production and the corporate bottom line. This was unacceptable, and I knew that I could change all of this, but to do so, I needed to be given free reign to come and go as I pleased and have final say on equipment and methods. Like many skilled polishers, I was a major prima donna and couldn't stand the corporate environment. One night, I slipped a note under the door of the plant manager. I was working the second shift, so I was unable to talk to him in person. On the note, I told him that if he gave me full freedom and allowed me to work without any control of a supervisor, I would deliver to him at least six gas bars a week. I knew I could do things my way and control who touched the parts. I would be able to turn this thing around. The next morning, I now ex-supervisor came to me and said, I don't know what you did, but you are on your own now and you better deliver. This was great. I could work when I wanted to and put in as many hours as I like. Company engineers were provided to me and I designed new machines and developed new methods to produce these parts. The first week, I surpassed my promise and delivered 12 units. This would continue, and many units would flow out of my area. As I could control the hours of my crew, one of the guys I had working with me was able to take advantage of this. He could spend more time completing parts for another project that went into the M1 Abrams tank. This would prove to be very important very soon when the Gulf War started. Because of my success, whole assembly lines were now able to produce large numbers of a machine that sold for close to $1 million per system. By the end of the year, the corporation was able to realize a significant increase in revenue. 
Almost everyone involved with this project, from planners to production control personnel, received raises and promotions, except for me. At the Christmas party that year, the general manager gave me a pat on the back and said thank you. The plant manager took me out for a prime rib dinner. It's like they say, the better you are, the more you stay where you are, and everyone rises to their own level of incompetence. The good part of the extra overtime was that I was able to buy Danella a nice two-tone Rolex watch for Christmas that she is still wearing today. Needless to say, my success and independence made me a target for some people that felt snubbed by what I had done. In the optics industry, we have a saying that nothing you do matters unless you can actually finish the part. Getting something close to specification doesn't count. We had lots of people that thought getting the parts close was being productive and equivalent to actually finishing a job. They would toil for days on something and depend on me to bring it to specification and completion. One day I came into work and was told that some important part was very close to being complete and I only had to take it off the machine in a few minutes and perform the final test. The guy promptly punched out and left, expecting to get credit for all his hard work. Needless to say, the part was not finished and would require more work to pass. The next day, this person complained and was able to convince my ex-supervisor that I had dropped the ball and allowed the part to miss being completed. This ridiculous story was seized on and used as an excuse to relieve me of control of my department. There was no way that I would let them get away with humiliating me and continue to receive the benefit of my labor. That night, I called my brother from the office and told him I was going to leave and wanted to help him with his company. The next day, I went to see my doctor told him I was stressed, and with the note I got from him, I returned to Perkin Elmer and took an immediate leave of absence. The personnel department was shocked, and the effects were instantaneous. The remaining crew was unable to maintain production levels. Work had to be sent to other areas, and contracts were lost. The department I had built was eventually closed down. The special machines I designed were sold to Japan, and the end result was a loss of strategic capacity that I believe hurt our country. Whenever you were asked if you can do a job, tell them, certainly I can. Then get busy and find out how to do it. Theodore Roosevelt. NK Entertainment. My brother Norman, like many of our friends, also went into precision optics manufacturing, except he was involved in another aspect, thin film coating. This is the process of evaporating micro-thin layers of material onto the finished surface of a lens such as magnesium fluoride, for an anti-reflective coating, or aluminum for a reflective coating. Magnesium fluoride is what gives the bluish color you see on the lens of a camera or binoculars. He did this for several years before starting his own business that was involved with specialty lighting for the entertainment industry. This was an era of discos and nightclubs, and there was a big demand for the installation of dance floors and lighting features associated with such. Many restaurants decided to build these areas into locations to increase revenue and sales of alcohol. Norman had several contracts to retrofit whole chains of restaurants and was doing quite well. Besides installing off-the-shelf lighting systems, music systems, and related hardware, he also designed and marketed his own line of lighting controllers and a variety of laser projectors. Laser projector is a system that shoots out laser beams to perform a laser light show. This was an industry in its infancy, and he was able to offer a product at a substantially lower price than available from other sources. One of the more interesting people that became involved with my brother in his laser endeavors was a brilliant yet eccentric person named Fred Lord. Fred was a protege of a laser pioneer named Gary Stadler, who was in turn a protege of the eminent scientist Dr. Bob Beck. I mention this because Fred would go on to be instrumental in future developments of both Norman's company and my company, the one that I would form later. Bob Beck would also re-emerge later in my life and be responsible for important developments historically and technologically. One of the ongoing projects that Norman was working on with Fred was the attempt to construct a 300-watt continuous beam argon laser projector system that would be capable of displaying graphics on anything from the side of a mountain to the surface of the moon. At the time, nothing existed capable of such a feat, and effort was focused on finding a corporation interested in using the system for the purpose of advertising. 
Images of a laser beam riding on the moon were used by NK Entertainment to promote their laser projector systems. This was not lost on certain entities operating on levels of the U.S. government. This was a time when anybody involved with laser technology was closely watched by the CIA. By the time I left Perkin Elmer and went to work with my brother, he was already well established and had built many nightclubs and sold numerous laser projector systems. About the time he was contracted by the Hilton Hotel in Las Vegas to produce entertainment theme aspects for a large private party being put on by Conrad Hilton for New Year's Eve. This was a lavish affair that had a James Bond theme. The contract required large murals depicting different James Bond movies, a huge mock-up of a moon lander-type structure located in the center of the ballroom, numerous lighting and pyrotechnic effects, and a high-power laser light show. Norman brought in an artist from Hollywood who was famous for having done major portions of the set design for the recently released Star Wars movie. The artist brought with him an associate named Gil that would prove to be a very interesting character. When I came to Vegas to get involved with the project, we were down to two weeks' time to complete the job before the party. Things were going slow, and we were having difficulty dealing with the local Vegas Hilton production personnel who were not at all happy with Hollywood people coming into town to produce a show that they felt should be done in-house. We were not allowed to use any Hilton equipment or facilities. We were constantly subject to backbiting and unfavorable comments. Fortunately, the work was completed and the show proceeded. One of the perks that came with the job was a suite at the Las Vegas Hilton that I stayed in for the two weeks and a table at the party for my brother and I and our family and guests. This is a black tie event with the best food and live entertainment that the Hilton Hotel could muster. Before dinner, the guests gathered in one ballroom where the Bond murals were located. There were tables all over, loaded with hors d'oeuvres. I have never seen so much shrimp. When it was time to move into the main ballroom, I was so worried that all this food was going to be wasted. The main course was prime rib, and there was a show put on featuring dancers portraying characters from James Bond movies. Once midnight arrived and the show was over, their ballroom doors were opened, and I was amazed at how fast the people cleared out and began gambling. The next day, our crew tore down the installation and prepared to return home. That night, when I went back to my room from my final night at the hotel, I was met in the hall by Gil, the mysterious associate of the Hollywood artist that had already left for home. Gil was an older guy, balding with his hair going gray. He spoke with a thick accent. He advised me that he had been sharing a room with the artist and needed a place to sleep. And would it be okay to stay with me that evening? Sure, no problem, I told him. Yes, and he was happy to sleep on the floor. That night, he used to tell me about himself. And things got strange. Gil explained that he was from Lebanon and he was working with the U.S. government and some well-known high-ranking people. It seems that he was involved with the CIA in some capacity to assist Iraq in its war with Iran, which was going on at the time. Apparently something bad happened to Gil's family in Lebanon at the hands of the Hezbollah, and Gil had a grudge against Iran. In the short time he had spent with me that evening, not too many details were disclosed. Most of the information and activity was handled by my brother. Apparently, this person needed to spend some time with me to determine something about me personally. This was my initiation into covert activities involving the CIA. In time of war, the first casualty is truth. Boat Carter, whenever you are asked if you can do a job, tell him. Certainly I can. Then get busy and find out how to do it. Theodore Roosevelt. Helping Saddam. The deal was simple. Saddam Hussein needed American made equipment to bolster his forces and give Iraq a tactical advantage. Items that were provided would be purchased with the 100% markup being paid by Saddam. The first items on the list were Motorola handheld communication devices. Now, why would the CIA need assistance from naive young Americans such as us to be involved with supplying goods? like this to a warring country. Was this a test for future assignments, or were we just disposable patsies that could be used and discarded should things get bad? 
Norman did most of the work and had several meetings with important individuals involved with this operation. At one time, I contacted an Iraqi engineer, who I knew that was still an employee of the Perkin Elmer Corporation. He told me that he would not be interested in being involved, and said that he had great fear that his family still living in Iraq would be in great danger. I had no idea just how evil Saddam was and his history of violence against the people of Iraq. One of the persons we recruited to help us was my friend Bill, who was working at that time for Hughes Aircraft Ground Systems Division. Bill was an engineer and was working on advanced phase array radar systems. This is a special type of radar that can track up to 50 objects at a time. Turns out that Saddam knew this and wanted to acquire this technology for installation at the Baghdad airport. This was something far more sophisticated than Motorola radios, yet we initially did not see a problem. It was about this time that we became aware that the FBI was getting involved and began to investigate what we were doing. Bill withdrew immediately and became very paranoid that he was being monitored. Everything came to a halt, and all the agents involved disappeared from the country. Nobody got in trouble, and no money was ever exchanged. Reagan was president at the time, and it would be many years before the U.S. government would admit to being involved with supporting Iraq in its war with Iran. There is no future in any job. The future lies in the man who holds the job. George Crane, Return to Optics.